Hello, people. Hi. So, I'm Romeo. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at MaugsMF, just like my name. And I co organize a conference in France called Ancrafts, which you should really go. Come, come to France. Let's do something. So, we're here to talk about property based testing, right? I hope we were in the right session. So, who here knows what is a property? Well, kind of a lot, of, almost half of you, right? So, for the others, for, for the sake of this presentation, we start with a really gross uh, definition of properties. We, we say that it's something that is always true. This is not really true, that there are more details to it, but let's keep it that simple, right? And by something that's always true, I do not mean a tautology, which is also something that is always true, not an invariant, which is also something that is always true. So to give a little more detail, a property is something that is always true to your context, right? It's not absolute. Let's, let's keep this. Who here has ever done the bowling cutter? Oh, quite. Who here has ever played bowling? Okay, uh, a little more, a little more. That, that's better, that's better. So, uh, lots of you haven't played at all. So, the, in the bowling game, the bowling cut is just you have to do the scoring algorithm of the bowling game in, in the program itself, right? But the bowling game is you threw, threw a ball, uh, ten, you have 10 uh, frames, to try, try 10 different frames where you have 10 different pins in front of you to try to make, make them go down. And you have a twitch frame, two, two balls that you can throw to make them go down. And the number of points is the number of pins that you can make go down, right? And usually, usually your, your score is the sum of all this. Except when you do a strike or a spare, which are special cases in a strike. You make them all go down the first ball of your frame, and then you have 10 points plus the bonus, the, as bonus points to this frame, the points of the next two balls. And a spare, when you take two balls to do this, like 5 and 5 or 0 and 10, and the frame has 10 points plus the score of the next ball. So, thing is, if you were to do the bowling cutter together here in CDG, in classical be example based testing using it isn't CDG. You probably write it like this, right? We have the case where we have no points, then the score is zero. We have uh, the names of the tests are awful. This is not a coincidence. I have the, in this entire presentation, I have made it a priority to have really awful test names. And we will see why soon. So then we will go to a, I have some single points, and it's the sum of them that is my score. Then we would try a spare. So here we have 3 and 7, that's 10 points, and 1. And you see that we have 3 plus 7 plus 1, and 1. This is the bonus. And we'll try another spare, just to not do the same thing. And then we'll try a strike, a more complex strike, in a perfect game. That if we were to do this cutter here by doing TDG and try example by example, this would be pretty much what, what the test we will do. And in the end of the day, we know that each one of those tests do not represent every single possible entry point, but you know that they are there to represent a more generic one each, right? So quick question. Today, who here does tests at all? Okay. Well, uh, keep your hands up if you do TDG. And now, keep your hands up if your tests today resemble this. All oh, right, we have few hands. You are lying. You, you are liars. You, your tests do not resemble this. Your tests resemble this. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, if, if you are honest to yourselves, this is what your tests look like, right? Today, you, I, I'm kind of exaggerated. I mean, this, there's some level of caricature here, but 
you are, you are doing some beans, where, where some pojos where you're putting things inside things, inside things, inside things, inside things, until you can make a call and search for a result. Well, here my result is Boolean. Otherwise, I would put things inside things inside things to create my result and, and, and say that they're both equal. Does that ring a bell to everyone? Right, right. So let's go back to our simple. Uh, we, will go, we will go back to this. Well, let's go back to this primitivism here that are not real, real life up to now, right? What is the problem of this? Well, there are several, but the names are awful, right? And this is not to represent a real life. And this does not represent a all possible case. We're we just putting some election here. We are, we are putting some people that represent all the others, right? And last night we see what elections can do, right? So, <laughs> thing is, What I want is not to do examples. What I want is to test all the behavior here. Each one of those cases, there are three cases here. Those two are the same thing. Those two are the same thing. And those three are the same thing. What I want is to test them together. Because by creating different tests, what I'm saying is that they are different things. So right now, when I get to this, I have to search what, are, what are, is the more generic thing that is being tested here. Well, I could just do let some of them in leave three, right? That would be better or not. So, and, I, and when I get here, I have to read either document in my name or read my input and try to understand what does it represent and read my output and try to understand what does it represent. This is a fa fa weakness at least. Well, examples are very good. I'm not saying you should not do them. What I'm saying is, who he has ever done BDD or tried to do BDD, tried to do a, a three amigos, right? Those few people there. When you speak with a business domain expert, that person, you have to fight with them to give you your examples, right? That person tries to give you business rules. It doesn't want to give you examples. It doesn't want to say, well, when I put, this, uh, when, when I put the, 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 these entry points here, in, I have this behavior, and then I have these outputs. It doesn't want to tell you this. It wants to tell you, tell you what I said in the beginning. He wants to tell you, when I, when I, when, when I don't have any spares and I don't have any, any strikes, then my score is the sum of all pains you, you put down. When I do have them, then my score is different. That's what the business domain wants to give you. And that's what you're trying to represent by, a, by an example. And fair enough, you should still try to keep taking those examples from the business. Because just that, that dynamic of trying to extract the examples will change the views of the business rules. So, so that's very positive. You should keep trying to extract those examples. But once you do, we still want to test the business rule. So let's improve this. Who here has, has ever done parameterized testing? Uh, quite a few, quite a few, quite a few. That, that's good. That's very good. Uh, if I, in parameterized testing, I could merge those two together, right? Like this. This is the first two I had. And then, as I was already putting those parameters to my test, well, it was not expensive to put two more, right? It was not very expensive. So what you see here is that usually, I have a very pit peeve here, is usually people doing parameterized testing. They, uh, they have the f this failure in my view, which is they try to pass the inputs and the outputs as parameters. But then, this is not very different from doing this, separating different tests, right? If you were to block this, if you were to do parameterized testing, but not put every input and output as parameters, at least one of those is blocked. 
then each test represents a specific thing, and it's just parameterizing what is variable about it, right? For example, I, in my in a old client, I had parameterized integration testing that have one test for, uh, that, that took URLs and HTTP, uh, HTTP codes and say, this URL should give this HTTP code, this URL should give this code. Okay. We could probably have split this and, they, and give, well, those URLs should work, this is a test, those URLs should work in a list. And another test, those URLs should fail in a list, right? That, that should be better. So here, Yes, just taking the nominal case and say all oh, those are nominals, and the behavior is that is the sum, and the score should be between zero and three hundred, which are the bar minimum and maximum score in the bowling game anyway, right? So, thing is, I usually have a remark, remark here when I do this presentation, which is, have I not put the solution in the test when I did this? And, and I, I would argue that not yet. We, we, are, we are almost in the limit, limit of doing this. This is the most con contentious case I can find. I, I def I'll defend to you that tests do uh, have to roam in the domain of the problem and not in the domain of the solution. Your code can, can roam in the domain of the problem, domain of the solution. Usually it doesn't. Usually your code just speaks about the solution, never about the problem, that's sad. But your test should remain firmly in the domain of the problem <laughs> and not the solution. And we still could do several solutions here that would, have would pass this test, right? Thing is, once you did this, now I only have a single test for all the binomial cases. And now when I come to this, here I was testing, these entries should have this output. These entries should have this output. Here I'm testing, these entries here should have this behavior. You see the change? We were from input, output, input, output, from inputs, behaviors. And that's Quite, uh, it seems like a nit nitpicking, but that is a very important change. That is a very important split. We're here because here, although we are not using any frameworks to do it, we are starting the beginning of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about property-based testing. We are starting to uh, specify the behaviors of a business rule inside the test itself, right? Because Usually, when people come to presentations about property-based testing, or when you, if you go online and you search a tutorial about property-based testing, you have the properties that I hate seeing in tutorials because it's always the same. You have, well, the sum of two integrals works, right? Or is associative. Thing is, those properties are very good. I, I mean, I'm not sp spitting on mathematical properties like associativity, uh, having a neutral number or having an identity, identity um, object or having a commutativity or something like this. Those are very cool properties and if you are searching for them right now, do keep searching for them. If you're not, you should look at them. But my point here with you today is to dispel the myth that property-based testing is something that A, is only for people doing for FP, is not the case. I'm doing this in Java. I could actually do this in Java 6. six. So it's really not a point. Second, that property-based testing is something for only people doing mathematical stuff. And what I want to show you to you today is that your business domain is filled with domain invariants, and those domain invariants can be tested with properties. Those domain invariants are called your business rules. And you should be testing those business rules today. And you are not. I mean, maybe. Who here is testing those business rules today with property-based testing? No, all right. So <laughs> you should. So once I started doing this, I still have problems, right? The first one 
is that I still have to, I, now I have the behavior here, I do, not have, I do not have to go to the output and try to understand what is this, oh, this is the sum of all my inputs. What is this? Well, this is the sum of my inputs and a bonus, right? This is something I do not have to discover by reading, because here I have spelled it out. I have specified it into the test itself. But I still have to read those and try to understand if I do not know the business domain rules. And usually you don't, right? It's easy in the bowling, but usually in a real application, you do not know all the business rules. So if you are blindly trying to find your way to those business rules, this is better than nothing, but it's not perfect, right? It's not, we could do better. And there is also another pres very personal problem with this. Is that I find this really boring. But, well, that's just me, maybe. So, how can we do better? Don't, don't, don't fear. In the beginning, it's strange. Don't, 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 don't fall to the trap of thinking that something that is not familiar is hard or, uh, or, or worse. It isn't familiar, maybe now, but... What I'm saying here, basically, assumptions is something that already exists in GUnit. I'm not talking about anything. Uh, the only things here that my framework gives me is this and this, right? Everything else are already things that you can find today without anything else, importing anything else, with just GUnit. You just import GUnit itself. Assumptions are when they fail, the test is not executed. The test doesn't fail, the test is not executed. And assertions are, when they fail, the test fails, right? This is already current G-unit behavior. And I want to dispel another, another myth here, is that property-based testing is something that you need uh, to learn a lot of new frameworks of things, or maybe even a new language to do. If you're doing Java today in a legacy code base today, you after this presentation, you should probably be able, in your real code base, to start playing with property-based testing in about 20 minutes of investment. So we really should do it, right? So here what I'm saying is, if you give me only integrals between 0 and 4, now I'm cheating, because I'm not testing every possible nominal case. I'm just guaranteeing that if you all are between 0 and 4, I never have a sparrow strike, right? This is not good. It's just better than before. And that's what I'm trying to push you to do, just to do better than before. And assuming the no, my number of frames is between 0 and 20, then I should have, my score should be the sum of my balls, and which should be between 0 and 300, right? Now, what I find striking about this is, one, now I have my business domain spelled, so this should help me more understand my business domain quickly, just by reading it. Two, I really don't, don't like the idea of, to every test, writing this. This is painful, right? Every new test I want to test my behavior, I have to write those things, this is very painful. And that's a good thing, that this is painful. It was not painful here at all. And here it is. What I wanted to show you is, I'm not, I'm not claiming that property-based testing will solve all your problems, or that you can test everything with property-based testing. And while I not, do not claim that tests themselves will solve all your problems, but most untested code bases that are cross, legacy code bases that are cross, the real awful code or atrocities that I see, are, uh, are done by people that did not test at all. The, the worst of the worst are done by people that did not test at all. Because if you're doing TDD right, creating that class that should be 40 classes, not 14, 40 classes, is very, very, very boring. You play on people's laziness. Just by doing TDD, they are dropping that behavior away, just that one. Right? And here, 
I get in another behavior, which is I had no problem when I, when I created my examples having those inputs. But as soon as I passed here, it became clear uh, that I have an, another thing that, that comes up, which is this really should be another object. If I have to, in every property, create, create those filters that say, well, yeah, I take any input, but you know, really, what I want is the inputs between this and this. You, will, you should have value objects. And the, your property-based testing makes the, those value, the, this, the, your failure to have value objects scream at you. And that's a good thing. And you do not have them enough, enough today in your code base. So just by doing them, you should start seeing those things pop up. So do. So, thing is, if you look at my next assumption, which takes this together, what I'm saying is, if I have a spare, then, then my to think my score should be greater or equal. This is not my business rule, right? I did the same thing here when I do parameterized testing. I just put all my two cases of spares. And I said, well, it should be greater than, my, than, than the sum of my tries, of my balls, right? The, this is very weak. This is not my whole deal. This is not my whole property. Why did I do this then? I did it because there is no, I, I did not find a way of writing this and not put part of the solution into the test itself. And that's the line. Because if you start putting the solution in the test itself, while you're testing is not no longer that your, com your program has this behavior, but the program behaves like itself. And that's usually true. That's usually a tautology. A program usually behaves like itself, right? So your, your test drops in usefulness. So we still can do things like, well, it is greater than, it is greater than this. Then you create a weaker property. You do not create a property, unlike this first one here, that just solved, just solved all my tests here. Those tests could disappear and be replaced by it. My second one could not. What I'm showing to you is that even if you start to do property-based testing, sometimes you have to achieve a limit and say, OK, I'll have some weaker properties and some example-based testing. The two will, the two will complete each other. And that's fine. That's fine. There are limits to this. There's not a perfect silver bullet. That's fine. We should still use it when you can use it. And that's a lot of places. So let's get back to this, right? Because your tests today are not, like I said in the beginning, are not like the first tests I've shown. They are more like this, right? That's Everyone here understands this test right now, if I don't ask uh, really quick like this. It's very understandable, right? I mean, everyone can see that this is the single value that changes anything in my test, right? It's obvious, I mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm testing is that when this value is bigger than the threshold, then this thing here is true. It should be obvious to everyone. Well, in real life, you probably put some sugar into this, right? In real life, you probably, right now, you are probably just either putting this into builders or putting this into fixtures, or at least putting comments to say, this is the important thing, right? Well, I, I, I'm character, it's a character here, but you, you get my point. In real life, you're trying to show that this is the important part. Because in real life, you have no choice right now. You are creating that 
objects that you put inside an object, so you put inside an object, so you put inside an object, and most of them have mandatory fields that you just have to kind of fill. Right? So what you are doing, what, what I'm telling, trying to tell you here today is that what you are currently doing is already the poorest way of doing property-based testing ever. Because you are doing random entry points. It's just that they are random exactly once. They are random at programming time, not, in, not even compiling time. You, it's like throwing a dice and choosing this one and saying, well, this is my random entry here for this thing that is mandatory. When, and what I'm trying to convince you is that if you were today to start using random inputs here and here, and here in everything that you should you're just saying, I do not care about the value of this, right? Then nothing could change, right? Nothing should change. This test here, what the testing is, if the dosage goes beyond at least four grams, then I should have this alert of, I'm a, I'm a doctor that's prescribing something that will kill my patient. This is the test, right? And I created a patient and a drug, and a dosage, and a pack of drugs, and a period of day for, for, for my prescription, etc., etc., just until the point that I create a prescription. And, the, and my test is, well, that prescription that is prescribed by the doctor, it should be on alert. So, if I were to put everything else beside this here as random, the test should still pass. And if someday it doesn't, if I, if I put random in everything else, and at some point the test does not pass, what does that mean? It means that either there was a bug that you have not foreseen in your test and you have to find it, or that your understanding of the business rule was bad. You have a bug either in the code or in your understanding of the business rule. And that's the point of property-based testing. The point is that property-based testing is a bet. It's like an insurance. When you take an insurance policy, you are taking a bet with your insurer. You are betting every month, I'm betting that this month I will have an accident, or someone will steal something from my house, or I'll have a fire. And your insurer is betting, we will not. We will not. This month, this will not happen. And every month, you lose that bet, and you're happy. Right? It's the same principle. You're taking a bet around what you think is true about your code. And the framework is trying to bet with you that it's false. You are wrong about what you understand about your code. And when it's green, it doesn't mean you are right. It just means I could not have you this time. But I will someday. It's just this time I haven't. Right? And this is also true to your current example-based testing. When an example-based testing, when this goes green, it is only saying I could not have you this time. The problem is next time you try the same thing, right? Crazily trying and trying the same entry point and try to prove you wrong. So it has very little chances of actually going for proving you false someday. Whereas this will try by changing some entries and respecting what you believe to be true. You will not try things outside of your beliefs, you just try things inside your beliefs and try to prove you wrong. And maybe someday it will. <clears throat> and if I were, uh, first I say if I were to keep this fixed and everything else random, and if I were to go further and say, well, I don't want this to be fixed to, I, not want, I really don't want to say that for test that is only four, I want to test everything that is bigger than three grams, because it's me a problem, right? And tomorrow it finds that three and a half doesn't. 
Well, you have discovered either a bug on your understanding of the problem or a bug in your code. And if months later it discovered that 40 or 100 grams doesn't yield this, then to be fair, you probably have a bug in your code. But that's good, you discover it, right? So how do you do that? How do you do that today? Uh, every property-based testing framework, I mean, even if you don't do Java, that this is a quick check, unit quick check that I'm using here. It's just a plugin that you can use with unit today. So if your code base is using unit today, you can just put this in Maven and start using it. Uh, but even if you don't do Java, you have Scala checks ever else. If, what I mean is, how can we do this today? And my point with you is that even if you do the, all, this awful thing I'm doing, and you should not, never, okay? But even if you do this awful, awful thing here, which means just copying and pasting what I have already in my test, everything in this presentation is hugely legacy, and that's not a coincidence. I'm doing this to show you that even in your current legacy code bases, you can really do it feasibly and quickly. Today, next Monday, please do it. So, even if I were just to take this and copy and paste it to a class and say, I'll just I call random and in everything I do not care. Right? That it takes seconds to do this. Literally. Even if I were to just copy and paste it and put randoms in my holes in the points that I do not care about, I would end up with a generator that I could use with each of those frameworks. And I would end up with a test that I exaggerated when I do this. We could do it with way less. I, I, I apologize, but it was just to show the worst case scenario with a test that goes from this to this, to those two lines. And those two lines, what they are telling me <coughs> is that my dosage is greater than three, then I should have a is little alert. What those t this test is telling me is directly my business rule. Nothing else. And it's also showing me that I have a violation of the Demeter's law in my code base that is huge. But fair enough. The, co the passing to property based testing will not heal magically your code base. Your legacy will still be there. But now you have tests that instead of, I get here and try to understand what you did and what was important, what was not, I forget completely about everything that is not my business rule. And th those tests are testing everything they could test outside of it, are testing the business rule itself. So you have a test that is terser, smaller, that tests more, and, test, and tests your business rule. I count that as a win. And if, you, if, if I were to execute this, you understand that it would fail, that my first test passes and this one should fail. Yeah, pretty sure. Because in that specific case here, I have created uh, a code that does, does only take dosage into consideration. And it was the case that I was trying to illustrate that we, have, we find surprises, right? We could find that uh, pregnant women have different, different rules for when they relate to, relate to medication or allergic people or other things, right? Your business rule can have some complications, some compoundness, com some compromises. And the thing is, Usually you don't know. Usually your business people don't, don't have in mind all those complications, or they have and they think it's obvious, 
So they ask, they, they just think that you should know it. And usually, if you, when you have an old code base, you have past generations and generations of people working there that have crossed several different corner cases and put that into code, right? And that code, even if it has a lot of bugs, you know things about your domain, because nobody bothered to put the why, they just changed over time. So the code knows things about your domain that your team does not, and that it, maybe even our business domain experts do not know, because the code is older than they know, right? Who has lived there, that here? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I have lived this set so many times. And, and then you can use that property-based testing to ask questions to your code, as it were another business domain expert. Sometimes it will be wrong because it has bugs, but you can ask it. And asking it is a powerful move. Because now, when, you have, when your business domain expert gives you a, a business rule, you can quickly go and write this as a process based testing, make it roll with your code, ask your code, is this rule true? And if it comes up with a, uh, an exception, you can either ask yourself, is my bug code, do I have a bug? Or go to the business case, your business domain expert and say, hey, have we forgot a corner case here? And you have this tool to help you have this discussion, right? And this is important. You can also use it because you can ask questions to your code. You can also use it as a very good tool to do characterization testing. You get to the unknown code, you have no properties to test with them. <coughs> Sorry. No properties to test with them. You get to that unknown code, and you put properties to say, well, I think it has this behavior. I think, uh, I think when, I, when I have entries like this, I should have this behavior. So you test what are your ideas of the code to make a test that marries to the code itself without understanding what it does. When you have a huge blob, it helps a lot to do this. And you should. So, four ways to, of using characterization, challenging your business domain experts, testing from a route that given by the business domain experts, or taking together your current tests and merging them together into properties, right? And with these four users, each one of them greets you, brings you a good value. I usually have some so people have, usually have four problems when they, I give this presentation to them. So I, I'll answer to you before asking questions. I'll, I'll answer those four right now. Usually I have, hey, but isn't this less sure than normal testing? Because it can fail someday and don't know when, right? So I already have given the answer to the, this today. I, I have go a far away from myself which is, no, 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 you, you are not testing less. The thing you're testing is to assure that, that this behavior here is true, and this behavior here is still tested, right? So you're not testing less, you're testing more, right? That's my f the first fear people have. There's a second fear people usually have, which is, <clears throat> what does it happen when I, I, I have Maven, right? And, I, and when I do a Maven release, and I have continuous integration, and I, I do a Maven release with Jenkins, and the property-based testing just fails. It, it worked in the dev, dev's machine. It worked when I committed, but I've tried to release, it fails. Well, if that happens, it's the same situation where you try, it, it is building Jenkins to do a release, and someone from QA arrives and says, hey, I have found a bug. What do you do today when someone from QA say, hey, I have found a bug, even if your release is building? Either, either you say, well, let's stop everything, 
or you say, well, let, let's just forget about this right now, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you choose which one you really do, but uh, it's one of those two. And you can still say that with property-based testing. It's the same situation, right? Another usual consideration I have uh, with this is, well, Romeo, my tests are slow, are very slow. Because what I haven't said here is, it cannot try each and every entry, right? It cannot, it's not possible. It cannot just try even every, every possible input here. So it tries, like, each time you execute it, it tries 100, 100 of them, that's all. And each time you execute it, you have to try a hundred different 100 ones. Is that slow? Isn't, no, it is not. Uh, if you have a very, a very good test done normally, view init test conditions, is it, it is not slow. But telling you, well, if your test is slow, you should refactor it, is not helping, right? If I just tell, well, your test is slow, is because your tests suck, so you should change the test. It is not a helpful answer. So I'll give you a compromise a degraded view of this. If your tests take minutes to execute, or several seconds to execute, and you do not want to execute at 100 times, make them property-based tests. And before you make them faster, make them property-based tests and configure it so each time you execute it, it, it tries once. For performance sake, it will be the same thing. Nothing will change. Each one of them will be executed one time. But now, between each execution of the test itself, things are changing. We are not saying, I will have you next the next time and try the same input inputs. I was, I'm saying I will have you the next time and try a different one. It's already better. It's not perfect, it's not good, but it's better than what you have today. Right? There's a compromise. And then you make it faster, please. But start from there. Do your property-based test. And your test will end up at least looking, instead of looking like this, looking like that. It, it's something. So go into that direction. <clears throat> so what, what, what I have, we have seen is, properties can be extracted from a, but can be extracted from your current, your current tests. You can do it even in your legacy code base, you can do it even for your legacy test, and you can do it in legacy languages. And you can do it even if you don't do UFP. Right? And you should. And you should have different tests. And you should have it evolving every time. And not doing right now, it is a debt on itself. Where we get is, sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes you cannot change your current test. Sometimes you cannot discover things. Sometimes you, you lost into what you currently have. Create another file. Just create a new one. You can't start today. Just create a new file. You have no excuse. <laughs> so, I have prepared this presentation initially for 45 minutes, and I could keep going a little more, but I would like to have a change with you. Let's put some questions in it. Can we have some questions here? Or do people have questions at all? Yeah, go for it. Normally when a QA person comes, I found a bug, tells you what we did. Oh, very good one. So let's talk about shrinking. So usually when property-based testing fail, it tells you, I had this input here, and it did not work. You have to interpret it. You don't know why it did not work. Right? You don't know why it did not work. You just say, I have this, I have this input here that doesn't work. Right? And you have to do the, you have to try to find why it haven't. But property-based test frameworks try to help you there. It does shrinking. What is shrinking? As soon as it gets 
a entry that does not work, it tries to create simpler ones and see if they don't work too, to give you the simplest one they can. It does so by, by ex getting things out for an equivalent one that doesn't work. If it has one st big string that doesn't work, it, it cuts pieces of it and tries smaller parts of it to see if you have another one, a smaller one that doesn't work, for example. Right? And tries to find you the smallest input that doesn't work. As soon as you find one that doesn't work at all. I had the problem with uh, when I was testing uh, for integration tests, I was testing uh, API, uh, API calls that passes the body of my REST API as random to the, to the server. At the beginning, I had like, this huge uh, Japanese and uh, Korean characters string that, that was getting sent because it's random, right? And the thing is, I was thinking it was a char, char set problem. And what I saw was it reduced it to a very small string. And when I searched inside it, it was just non-printable characters that were crashing my REST API server. Right? So it gives you something you can work with. That, that's the main point of it. <coughs> and if you still need an example to better document it, there is nothing forbidding you to create an example one besides it. Right? You had a question, sir. It was the same. That's awesome. No more questions? Right. So, I'll show you just the speed of doing this versus this. Just to quell that performance doubt. And, well, you have a starting time for the framework itself, right? Once you did it, the tests themselves take like six to three milliseconds, like half a second, right? It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's very fast. And your business domain is filled with those. When I tell you, uh, when I tell you, this one here, I have lived that in real life, this one here where I told the lethality threshold, but you have those all, all the time. You're filled with properties. When you, when, and you, you have properties at the unit level, you have properties at integration level, you have properties at end-to-end -end level. The system itself has properties. Your delivery itself has properties. There is no kind of testing that you cannot do orthogonally, a little small of it of being a property-based testing and you are currently losing out on not doing it. And if I have just small minutes before I finish, I would like to tell you to try out fuzzers too. Fuzzers is like random testing, but the other side of the same thing. In property-based testing, you try, you try random things to test something you're sure of. At fuzzers, you try random things for things you don't know nothing about. And the two complement each other very well. Should I take a look at it? Thank you very much. Have a nice day. <laughs>